So I'm, I'm pleased to present um, the speaker today, uh, Dr. Kirk Griffin, and his bio is in the book, um, but I do think it's important just to maybe give a little bit of um, context around this. Dr. Griffin is the Director of Clinical Trials for the Sanford Project, an Associate Professor of Pediatric Endocrinology at USD. He earned his PhD in Cell and Developmental Biology and his MD at the University of Colorado completed his pediatric residency at Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital in Cleveland and a fellowship in pediatric endocrinology at NIH. From there, he went to the University of Arizona where he built a portfolio of basic and clinical research in type one diabetes before he was recruited to Sanford in 2013 to accelerate clinical trials in type one diabetes under the Sanford project. The learning objectives are listed there. Uh, Dr. Griffin is going to describe for us today um, his research efforts that span the natural history of type 1 diabetes and the PLEDGE project, which is a population screening study to identify children that might benefit from earlier intervention for type 1 diabetes uh, risk. So with that, I'm, I'm happy to uh, turn the floor over to Dr. Griffin. All right. Thank you, Laura. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me. And, uh, oh boy, that just went away there. Um, so as, as Laura said, th this is what I spend a lot of my life, life working on here. Um, I don't have a lot of disclosures. I lead as a uh, site PI, uh, several commercial industry sponsored clinical trials. Uh, none of that money comes to me, it all goes to Sanford, but in the interest of being transparent, there it is. And so you've heard a little bit about me. Uh, I don't see that many people uh, in the room here yet, but I think, you know, originally we were supposed to be meeting in person. I would really hope to have an interactive discussion, um, but I think it would help me to tailor this a little bit as I go through, if I can hear a little bit about who you are and kind of what you do. And so, I, and Christy, I know you, uh, obviously I know Laura, uh, and had some emails with Cassie, uh, that leaves Alyssa, can either speak up or uh, I don't know if you're allowed to. Or we can uh, should be able to chat. Mm -hmm. I got my chat window open. Or maybe somebody's just here occupying space and not there. Um Sorry, could you um, reiterate what you're looking for from? I want to know who who people are. Okay, great. Well, I can. You know, I can. Um, I can are, you, is it, are are these like clinic, clinical faculty? Are we talking about coordinators, uh, administrative staff? I I that I I'm not going to update my slides now, but I can at least tailor what I talk about to try to keep it interesting. Well, I can I can jump in here. I am a research assistant research professor and core coordinator. So, so you coordinate with the Dakota, but then do research in the population health department. So, thank you. I see Kim's on. Oh, here, Alyssa Schumacher. Can you see it, Dr. Griffin? Yeah, I can. Uh, first okay. student and Dr. Strom's. Like, okay. So again, you know that that helps me because I don't want to just speak completely over, completely under. Uh, and I think that's all we have here, at least for right now, right? If Dr. Hammer, Kim Hammer's on. Kim, do you want to give your background? Yeah, hi, I'm Kim Hammer, Associate Chief of Staff for Research at the Fargo VA. Um, I'm also a co-core director with Laura of the CRRFC in Dakota. Okay, and are, are you more from the oncology side or...? I'm more from the basic uh, basic science side, oh, okay. and then um, more basic science into translational, but not really. We don't have a whole lot of clinical trials right now. Great. Okay. All right. Um, so yeah, that that was going to be my next slide was supposed to cover that. Uh, so I appreciate having that. Um, I don't know that there are a lot of people here that have a lot of experience working with type 1 diabetes. So just as a refresher, most of what we deal with nationally, internationally, are adults with type 2. Um, my world is more type 1. So instead of insulin resistance and eventually uh, not being able to make enough insulin, this starts with not being able to make enough insulin because 
the immune system is killing off those beta cells that make insulin in the pancreas. And without that, the only way we have of treating it really for the last 100 years, 101 now, is multiple shots of insulin every day. Um, and, you know, so to me, as, as a pediatric endocrinologist, th this is about half of what we see in clinic. Uh, it's a very powerful motivator to try to figure out what can we do that's going to be different and ideally help address the underlying issues. And I want to show you a little bit about what we've tried, because some of that is tangential to the oncology space as well. Um, and then kind of what's really changed really in the last year and how we're trying to meet what uh, the upcoming needs are going to be and, and get ahead of that here. So we, we think about type 1 diabetes. It used to be called juvenile diabetes because you have this big peak in childhood. We don't go down younger. It's hard to get before one, but it starts really picking up. Uh, we used to say there would be a peak, you know, at two or three, that seems to be bleeding more into the adolescent onset. But what most people don't realize is you got this big blank space here that nobody really thinks about. Um, and yet, new onset type one continues. And if you look at it, it's less than half of the teenage peak, but it is still significant. And a lot of these people, uh, we see it all the time, they get, they're misdiagnosed. We know that Early on, it's, it's a much more aggressive, rapid onset. Um, the kids come in, most of them, and certainly in our clinics, in our hospitals, by the time anybody recognizes they have type 1, they are already in ketoacidosis. They are already sick. They are already in, in, into the intensive care unit. Um, as an adult, especially an older adult, it tends to be a much more insidious onset. It comes on more gradually. Many of these people that get picked up, by an AMC screening, maybe at the primary doctor, and they wind up getting put on metformin, they're assumed to be type 2. And yet they're not. And eventually they wind up, you know, just going burning through medicines, nothing's working. Eventually they have to be on insulin anyway. And they may or may not be recognized as type 1 or not. Um, but they're out there. And, you know, it's really the median age, you know, you don't, you can't go that far below 4 before you get into negative numbers that don't count. Uh, but you can go a long way the other way. So it's skewed. And the median age is, is probably somewhere in the mid-30s. Uh, and yet everybody thinks juvenile is still like this is a childhood diabetes. And so if we look at you know the natural history of this, you know, it, you have people who are born with a genetic predisposition, and genetics is probably somewhere between half or two-thirds of, of the risk here. And then it's how the genes interact with the environment. And we haven't been smart enough to really nail down what the triggers are, but something interacts with that genetic predisposition. And we have, here's a nice pretty islet that's sitting in the sea of the pancreas. Um, and the immune cells start acting up. You know, the immune system starts to recognize it. And it starts with really T-cell immunity. And you wind up with, you know, it's I, as the oncologists oftentimes call them, small blue cells. And these are actually kind of in that same class of small blue cells that other people think about. These are lymphocytes. They're primarily T cells, but now we also know the S and B cells. You actually have uh, uh, some evidence that there's a tertiary lymphoid organ forming there that's quasi like a lymph node or the spleen. Um, and at some point, those T cells start to activate B cells and the B cells start to make antibodies. And the antibodies don't actually contribute to the direct killing of the cells. It's really, you know, cytotoxic CD8 positive T cells that do that. But this eventually, it waxes and wanes. You, the immune system tries to control it usually, but eventually you get epitope spread, you get more antibodies involved, more T cells recognizing different antigens, and you start killing off the beta cells. And you can probably kill off half of them before even after a big meal, you start to begin to see loss of first phase response. In these, Islets and the beta cells in here are supposed to store up the insulin ahead of time so that when you need it, it's preformed, you put it out. And eventually you get to where you can't do that. The next step, well, maybe you can't even manufacture enough when you need to. And after a big meal, maybe your glucose goes up a little bit, not high enough to say, I have diabetes, but not low enough that it's normal either. And then it's probably somewhere around 80 to 90 percent of your beta cells killed off before you start having symptoms. And from there, especially in little kids, it's a short time before they come in very sick. 
wanted to talk a little bit about some of the players in the immune system. I mentioned already we have T cells, you have a naive T cell gets activated. And then depending on what cytokines are being presented to it and what the environment is and what co-stimulatory factors, that determines what kind of cell it turns into. And they have a lot of different helper T cells. These are all the CD4s we're just focusing on here. Um, TH1 and TH17s are bad actors in type 1 diabetes. They're, they're actually important and help drive the response. Um, regulatory T cells, that's what's supposed to be putting the brakes on the immune system and preventing it from overreacting, especially to our cells. Um, turns out people with type 1 diabetes, they don't have as many Pregs as the rest of us. And the ones they have actually aren't as functional. So you, there's a both a quantitative and a qualitative defect in uh, suppression by uh, regulatory T cells. Uh, the B cells eventually become plasma cells. They're the ones that make antibodies long term. Um, they, what's interesting is we use the antibodies as markers of autoimmunity, but they're not actually involved in beta cell destruction. Uh, the biggest role is probably the T cells. You know, we think about T cells interacting usually with androgen presenting cells, the adrenic cells, macrophages, uh, lying your hand cells. Well, it turns out the B cells that they put antibody on their surface, that can also drive T cell stimulation, and the B cell becomes a professional antigen presenting cell able to activate via class two antigens your CD4 positive helper T cells. All of that comes down to the immune synapse. And again, here's a generic antigen presenting cell. Um, again, this can be a B cell presenting on its antibody. The idea is you have a class two MHC loaded with a peptide that interacts with on the T cell, you have the T cell receptor. Um, that's what we call signal one. That activates the T cell, but what that T cell does with that activation depends on what other co-stimulatory molecules are involved here. And that's usually what we call signal two. And you'll recognize some of these, you know, uh, if you're from the oncology world, may look a little familiar, uh, CTLA-4, CD28, CD40, CD40 ligand, CD2, uh, LFA-3, all these things are things that oncologists are trying to push in one direction to enhance the immune response from a tumor escaping from uh, being hidden from the immune system. And yet we're trying to essentially do the opposite and do it gently so that we don't cause other tumors, but uh, at least hopefully balance and, and try to help with the autoimmunity. Uh, so you have on the energy presenting cells, you have these co stimulatory molecules. You also have cytokines, which are soluble signals that help shape this. Again, in type 1 diabetes, IL-2 and IL-6 are bad actors. IL-10, we think, is, is help as more of a regulatory inducer. Uh, interferons actually increase expression of class 1 MHCs on the beta cells and help to enhance CD8 uh, cell killing. And so if we look, you know, I, I know the immune system is complicated, um, but we have a bunch of different places that are druggable targets and, you know, some beyond uh, what are in, even in the boxes now. Um, and a lot of these we've actually tried in nuance of type 1 diabetes. Um, and obviously, because I'm still here and we're still treating with insulin, we have not had tremendous success, but I want to kind of walk you through what we do. So we usually, our gold standard is when we have a new onset patient enrolled in trial, we do a mixed meal tolerance test. So it's a, a meal in a glass, so a can of boost or insure or something like that, depending on what the study is, with the idea that protein on top of glucose tends to drive the beta cell harder and you get a maximal response of how much insulin makes. The problem is that these are all people that when they make insulin, well, they're already taking some from a vial or use a pump or a syringe, however it gets in the body. So you can't, if you look just at insulin, you can't tell the difference between what came from the bottle versus what somebody's making. But as we make insulin it's synthesized as one polypeptide, you have two disulfide bridges joining so that it loops on itself. And then proformal convertase snips that off. And so you have your A chain and your B chain and then you have your connecting or C peptide. And this is something that doesn't come in the bottle, but it does come one molecule of C peptide for every molecule of insulin that you make in your own body. So what we actually measure in these is C peptides, so we look at endogenous insulin production, essentially. 
And we know that from diagnosis over time, it goes down quickly over the first year, maybe a little more slowly the second year. And our ideal would be, boy, if we could at least stop that progression and have somebody keep going and just keep that insulin production flat, that would already be a huge win. Well, so how do we do with that? Well, here's a flash through of 20 years of trying to do this with different agents, starting with anti-CD3, uh, which we'll come back and we'll talk more about it in, the, in less than a minute and then in a couple of minutes. Um, and in each of these, I have the baseline C peptide just drawn as a green arrow, and that's what we would like to do. And boy, you know, here, boy, maybe there's a signal and you have some responders, some non-responders. Um, you look at, you know, CD, anti-CD3 was taking out your T cells. This is rituximab taking out, literally depleting your B cells. Well, you get a little bump here. You know, granted, it's one treatment up front. Little bump, but it's not really persistent. Um, here's interferon alpha. Boy, it's hard to really say there, there's much of a signal there at all. Uh, coming back to anti-CD3, this is the, before it was called teplizumab. Um, this is a larger nuanced study, and you can see again, you know, one treatment up front, you get a little delay, but then it starts going down as parallel to the other placebo curve. Um, instead of anti-CTLA-4 that is used in oncology, this is CTLA-4 as an artificial agonist uh, to mimic extra CTLA-4 stimulation and to put on an immunoglobulin background. Well, you know, maybe there's a, a little delay here, but boy, that's not a lot to get excited about. Uh, you're probably picking up on a theme here. Um, here's a drug called Alephacept uh, that is basically LFA4 on an IG, so it blocks CD2. Um, this one, the, the drug got taken off the market partway through this study, so we never recruit as many as uh, we had planned, but there's still, there's at least beginning to be a signal, and this is actually a, a drug that uh, is just now opening up a, a replacement drug for this, uh, in a clinical trial of nuancing. And so we're excited for that. Antithymocyte globulin. Well, you know, CD3 works. Well, maybe antithymocyte globulin. Well, uh, really, again, not much of a signal. And in, in, if you look across everybody, uh, certainly not in the younger people, if you look at the older adults, well, maybe there's something there. Um, we did a trial looking at some things that are supposed to support the beta cell, lansoprazole and citocliptin. So mimicking... Uh, GLP-1 and uh, gastrin to try to support the beta cell. No real effect there. Uh, tocilizumab. Well, I mentioned IL-6 is important to drive KH-17 cells that are important in uh, the pathogenesis of type 1. Uh, well, th this one we were site for, and this was published now two years ago. Again, there's not a lot of there there. Uh, Steve Gilman used uh, imatinib, so again, tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Some of the people on the call may be familiar with that drug or that class of drugs. Um, maybe a delay in progression a little bit, but really they overlap. Again, no there there. And then the one glimmer of hope is Mike Haller has actually uh, gone and looked at uh, preliminary information from a, a trial where they were essentially doing not so ablative bone marrow transplants for type 1 diabetes. That's pretty aggressive in my book. But he said, okay, what if there's part of their approach that may help reshape the immune system? And uh, he came back, actually, we, we saw APG didn't help here, but he actually came back and used it, the same drug at a third the dose and now there's at least separation between the placebo and the APG group that was in red. And so this has actually been some of this now being moved earlier in, in treatment and um, under development in some other ways for this as well, too. So short version is we've tried a bunch of things, working on a bunch of different areas of the immune system, and we're not having any luck. Um, some of this may be, we're, we're, you know, by that point, the immune system is really ramped up. Uh, some of this is, you know, we're just trying single agents. And realistically, if you look at you know, where we had success in other complex diseases, whether it's oncology, tuberculosis, uh, HIV, it's combination therapy. And so we're finally opening the door to that. So we come back to this natural history. You know, by the time you get to that, to clinical onset, you have a problem. And that 
you really killed off most of your beta cells, even if you preserve them, there's not that much left to work with. The other notion is, if, you know, this is uh, George Eisenbarth's adapted original design from you know, 25 years ago. It's drawn basically as a straight line. The reality is this is a waxing and waning, and then and near the end, it falls off the cliff as the immune response really accelerates. And there's this notion that as you get there, it's going to be harder to do anything with the immune system and or what beta cells you have left. And if we could come in earlier, we should be able to have a better effect, even with the drugs we already have at our disposal. The other problem with this, though, is it comes is when someone comes in in DK, there's no question. We don't have to predict they're going to get diabetes because they already have it. And that's the point where we can be justified maybe being a little more aggressive. But working backwards has been very challenging. Um, and the further back we come, the less absolute prediction we can make. And therefore, that also shifts how aggressive we can be ethically with various drugs, what risk is acceptable, or perhaps treating some children that might not need it. But all this has really led you know, over the last eight to 10 years, a reshaping of how we think about this. And again, this is similar underlying idea, but shifting it around a little bit. Saying you have a genetic risk, you have immune activation. Of the four antibodies that we measure, if you get one of them, you probably have a 20 year risk of about 10%. If you get two or more, it's not a question of, are you gonna get type one? It's a question of when. So we're, the, the trials community, the advocacy community has really been trying to reshape how we think about it and say, you don't have type 1 diabetes starting when you have uncontrolled hyperglycemia. You have it when you have the autoimmunity that is established. So two more antibodies we're saying is going to be when you start to have type 1 diabetes. And now we stage it according to, you still have normal blood sugar, that's stage one. And that's the place where, boy, we really can't push it. Hard. Stage two, you're starting to have a slightly high blood sugar, impaired glucose tolerance, but you're not at full diagnostic criteria. We know that's a much higher risk state because that's about 50% progression to clinical diabetes within two years. What used to be quote unquote new onset, we're now calling stage three. And then the people have had it for years, extended period, that's where we, we call it stage four. And so we're trying to move backwards into there. And so, you know, it's one thing for me to talk about you know, boy, if you have two more antibodies, it's really high likelihood. But, you know, here's the data behind. And as I said, there are four that we can measure. You know, if you have zero, when you're very young, it's still non zero risk of progressing. One, not so bad. You get that second antibody, boy, it really shifts. And these are survival curves without progression to clinical type one, fortunately, not a more permanent outcome. Um, and it may take 20 years. But your lifetime risk approaches 100%. So we're saying two more antibodies defines the onset of type one autoimmunity, and we're calling that stage one. Now, this is where it starts to get a little more exciting. This is a, you know, one of the ones that I showed you earlier. This is teplizumab. Uh, it's anti-CD3, it's modified, so it's non-depleting. So it doesn't actually kill the T cells, it just gums up the activation of, of them when they are presented antigen. And it, in new onset, this is loss of C-peptide over time in the placebo group. You get a delay of about nine months, and then yes, it goes down. So there's a sign of something there, but this is not ready for prime time. This is not a big enough effect to really be worth trying to do anything. This is the first drug that we have moved back into stage two. And when I say we, this is diabetes trial net, and we're a part of that as well too. Um, This study took 11 years to do. Uh, so just because it's hard to find those people, such a high risk, stage two is such a high risk for progression, it's hard to catch them. And the number one reason for the screen fail was we found something in stage two, and by the time we were ready to start the drug, they had already progressed and couldn't get the drug. But for all that, here's what we get. And now instead of looking at C peptide coming down, this is survival without progression to stage three. 
And you can see that that initial group, this placebo group, boy, look how quickly it drops. So you have 20% of them that within months are going to progress. Then it slows down a little. You look at median time to progression, this is now delayed almost three years. Now, that's obviously not where we want to be someday where we can prevent this. But three years, you know, I, I'll tell you just kind of the difference between trying to treat a two-year-old and trying to treat a five-year-old with insulin is night and day. Or even a 12-year-old and a 15-year-old, very different. And, you know, if you talk to families of people that are in that situation, boy, if they could delay it even by three years, that would be a huge help. Now, obviously, not everybody gets that. There's some heterogeneity. We're trying to understand some of the immunology behind that. And there's some interesting hypotheses that we'll see how they play out. What's interesting is if you look out here at the end, you have 40% of them who made it to six years without progressing. And I don't have the data to show because they're not published, but I've seen Kevin Harold, who has led this uh, you know, for 20 years with this drug. Uh, he, he showed some data at the immunology and diabetes meeting where these lines actually go out to 10 and then at about 10 years, they, they finally have these holdouts progressing. Now, this is all from one treatment up front. And granted, the treatment is a pain in the neck. It's 14 days of daily infusions, a um, little bit of uh, some adverse reactions to that sometimes. But one treatment up front to get this kind of delay, and especially for 40% of them, that it, it is not just three years, it's six years. Uh, that is really changing how we look at this. And, you know, in the 101 years since we've had insulin, this is the first time we have something that actually is showing a real effect at dealing with the underlying autoimmune. So this actually confirms what we've been saying all along, that, boy, if we could just go earlier, we'll have more effect. And this actually now has been approved by the FDA for stage 2 type 1 over age 8. And we're actually, uh, we had our site initiation visit two days ago for the study that's going to look at uh, kids under age eight. Um, and unfortunately, it's focusing primarily on safety and kind of ignoring the metabolic outcomes. The problem now is how do I identify who might benefit from this? Because these are not kids walking down the street with a rash or something else. Um, these are kids that were found by screening for antibodies. And we've done, a, most of that's been done by Diabetes Trial Net, who actually did that trial. And it's, it's really, a, a, and this organization had tremendous impact. They screened a quarter of a million people over the last 20 years. The catch is they look at family members of people who already have type 1. Well, they do that because they're at higher risk. Um, the catch is 92% of the people who are going to get type 1 don't have that family member. They're not qualifying for this study, and nobody's looking at them. So even if we saturate and got everybody that had a family member, we're missing over 90% of these. And that's where we come to pledge. How do we offer this to everybody? How do we expand this to general population? So this is not business as usual. This is not, we, we can't afford to have a coordinator sitting in each clinic trying to recruit people. Uh, the clinic can't afford that kind of disruption. So we've had to come up with a novel way to do this and implement this that doesn't break the clinics, that doesn't break our clinical research budget. And so we've really focused on a pragmatic design. How do we integrate into the clinics and really minimize the burden on everybody, providers, staff, families, coordinators, on down the line? We already have kids coming into group visits. They already have labs. Let's take advantage of that. Uh, we already have everybody on Epic. You know, one, one EMR to rule them all are leveraging that. We're leveraging all the infrastructure, infrastructure that we already have. We're using the MyChart to invite them to participate and to handle you know, collecting information for them, questionnaires. Uh, we're going to be looking at the economic analyses so that hopefully we can show that this is actually cost-effective. Uh, for right now, this is still research. It is therefore at no cost to the families. But the goal is to use the information we get out of this to show that it works. And I think the you know, other places have some preliminary evidence to support that, but also 
what does it cost when it is integrated into care? What is, we're already mimicking what this would look like someday where people come in, they're in the primary care office, they get it drawn, it's run, they get information, they go from there. So we're in a unique position to be able to measure that. So goals here, we're trying to, at a minimum, prevent that initial DKA. Uh, we're trying to identify patients for possible intervention, uh, teplizumab if they're old enough, uh, other intervention trials. And as I said, we have the uh, younger teplizumab trial coming now. There's an APG study that's about to open through trial as well. And then generate the support to, the evidence to support moving us into routine care along with everything else that we do in pediatrics. So what do we do? Uh, we invite everybody before their sixth birthday who has an appointment coming up. And uh, we were ahead of budget and under, ahead of schedule and under budget. So uh, we were able to add in uh, one off screening for the teenagers. The meat of this is we look at autoantibodies at about two years, about five years, and then once for the teenagers. Uh, we also, for the older two ages, we include CELAC panel, um, not because that's something that I'm particularly that interested in, but the genetics do overlap. And that's something that the families are interested in. We heard Marion Revers in Denver, who heads up the Barbara Davis Center in Denver, has done this and has found people are much more interested in signing up for the celiac screening than they are for the type one. Uh, so we're trying to leverage that too. And uh, we're, we're having an impact there too. The other thing that we're doing is we're trying to do a prospective validation of a genetic risk score. So we collect at whatever age they come in, we collect a blood spot. And this is not deep sequencing. We're not going to find out things we don't want to. There's 67 SNPs. And um, Richard Orm at Exeter is our uh, collaborator on this who developed it. Uh, he's validated against the UK Biobank and some other retrospective samples. This is a chance for us to kind of look at this going prospectively with the idea that, boy, maybe if you're in the bottom half of the risk pool, just from genetics, maybe you don't even need to do these. And maybe if you're between, let's say, 50th and 90th percentile, Maybe this is not a bad schedule. Uh, if you're in the 99th percentile, maybe we need to start early and, and go more often. Uh, we're not quite at the point where we're using that way, but I think that's where uh, certainly has potential to go and where I hope it does go. So the other thing this lets us do is, you know, we're collecting a blood spot, which is not something that we usually do in clinical care with one exception, and that is the newborn screen. And so we already have babies every day that are getting a heel poke and they're collecting a bunch of spots. And what we've actually done is we've actually reached out to the expecting mothers at starting at 36 weeks of gestation and offering them the opportunity to sign up their child ahead of time so that when they're born, the orders are there, they're activated. And when there's a nurse collecting this blood spot and filling up the, that card for the newborn screen, we get another spot. And that has actually worked remarkably well and really you know shows, you know, it's part of our feasibility aspect of this study shows it is feasible to do without breaking the system. And uh, that's actually a very low cost intervention there. So how do we actually make all this work? I talked about leveraging our infrastructure and you know, speaking of infrastructure, we have clinics. Uh, we have clinics that see kids every day. We have the kids that are coming to the clinics. And really the, the, the antibodies measuring them, you know, they're, oh, that's doable. Uh, the innovative part here is how we actually make all this work. And that is, you know, we, we have the Epic EHR. What we've done is we've coerced it so that every Saturday it looks out in the next 20 days and says, okay, which kids already have an appointment, they're eligible, and then automatically, it, it doesn't just generate a report that comes to us, it automatically sends a message to the parents, my chart that comes on the phone, parents get a message saying, your child's eligible for this. We're like, to see more, to go through it. They essentially self-consent on the phone. Um, and then we have the opportunity to enter orders on the back end. That's one part we haven't been able to automate. And then when they come in to the clinic, the clinic has a lab. They can stop off and have this done. It can be a finger stick, it can be uh, a venipuncture. Um, we initially tried to pick the ages based on, you know, when kids were coming in for, for shots. Uh, Turns out that those ages don't usually get a lot of blood draws, but if they do, we try to piggyback on them. But so now, starting at nine, kids are supposed to get lipid screen. So they already have a needle, a vein, they're already drawing blood. 
it's been very easy just to piggyback on that one. All these, uh, the antibody labs are CLIA grade, they're, they're clinically actionable. Um, we take advantage of, again, it is the infrastructure. All these clinics scattered across the upper Midwest, they already have couriers that are bringing samples every day to our, our central lab, which is, we probably can't see the window here, but it's right behind my back here. Um, so we take advantage of that. They ship it out to our partners up in Seattle who actually run the antibodies. And then the, the results come back right in Epic, just as any other lab results do. And that was something that actually our compliance people said we had to do that way because they, they are clinically actionable. Fortunately for most people, they're negative. Uh, and then if they're old enough, they're done. If they're really young, then we hold on to them. And then when they get close to that five-year-old gap, we'll are, they're already enrolled and the orders are already in. Um, those few that are positive, we're still working with that on the research side. So it's research staff who are contacting the family to explain what it means, setting up a confirmatory draw. And then if they're persistent, then we have a monitoring protocol where we look at, okay, let's follow you over time so that if and when your blood sugars start to go up, we can intervene before you get sick. Uh, for the kids who have confirmed uh, celiac antibodies, uh, those have been referred to GI and uh, had a clinical evaluation that's separate from anything that we're doing as part of the study. So what makes all this possible? Well, one of it, part of it is this is potentially really high impact. This has a potential. If this moves, if we can show that this is worth moving into standard clinical care, it will impact every kid in this country. It'll impact kids beyond this country. Um, other things that help us to kind of justify it, that this is, boy, this is a big thing. This is not our usual clinical research thing that we put through our startup and have, you know, coordinators do all their work. What helps us to justify that? Well, this, this is really hard to implement somewhere else. You know, we have this whole network of hospitals. We have this network of labs. Everything is integrated. We have our health system. We can measure the cost there too. Marion Rivers, again, you know, from Denver, who, who heads that center, he's on our advisory committee and, and he repeatedly has said he wishes that he could do something like this in Denver, but you know, you have a great children's hospital, you have a great diabetes center, you don't have this network of clinics and certainly not under one organization. So, you know, what helps us do it, we're leveraging what Stanford already does well every day. And we're really working hard not to break what Stanford does well every day because that would lead to it not continuing. We've had tremendous commitment from all levels of leadership all the way to the very top. Uh, we've had buy-in, just the IT build was 2,500 person hours just to course Epic to do this. Uh, I would not have thought it would take that much, but uh, that's what's that's the magic behind this. We've had a lot of personal outreach to providers and clinics. We've had a lot of buy-in from providers who when I've talked to them and given my little introductory, hey, here's what we're gonna be rolling out to your clinic. Almost invariably, one of the people in the room will, will speak up and say, you know, just last week I had another kid diagnosed with type one diabetes and they came in DK and I'm tired of this because they're so sick, they, they don't do as well afterwards. You know, th this is important. And then that last little detail of funding, you know, that doesn't hurt either. Again, you know, I've been very fortunate Sanford has uh, committed to, to helping to support this as well, but a lot of the funding for this comes from the Helms of Charitable Trust. A couple other tricks in terms of the integration here, if somebody's eligible, this is not a big bed, you know, for any providers, we hear BPA, best practice advisory, and we all kind of twitch because we get these things that get in our face and we can't do anything else until we address it. This is a gentle just reminder down the corner here where it says, you know, they may qualify. We actually have a way where you can add something to after visit summary where the family then uh, gets the invitation to participate after the fact. There's a way if they want to get drawn right there, we can actually have them sign up, do the self consent right in the room, and get drawn before they go home. One of the things that it took us a while to figure out is clinicians wanted a way to know if there was a child risk, how do we do this? And the initial approach was uh, kind of what they tried in Denver, and that is, well, put in the problem list. Um, it would be lovely to put do what they do in Denver, say something like pre-symptomatic type 1 diabetes, stage 1. Turns out that's not an option. 
our compliance people say, no, you need to use the existing ICD-10 code, and there is no ICD-10 code for this. Um, we're actually working to try to advocate to have some, but uh, they're not there yet. So this really isn't a, a great way for us to go. Um, compliance recommended R76.0, abnormal antibody level. I don't think anybody who sees that is going to know what that means. And I don't know, you know, if they're looking at the problem list at all, they're not clicking through to see what the details are that you have to click on to, to be able to see. So it, it's hidden in a place where it's, it's not actually helpful. And then we, we kind of came up with another approach um, that's, I think, has, has found a, a better balance. And this is something that I've seen used for much less important reasons, like Dr. Smith needs 30 minutes appointments with his patients when they come in. And this is something called a patient chart advisory. And it is a big red banner that as soon as you open the patient chart, it is there. It's kind of hard to miss. And we tried to put information that, you know, and so far people are saying is useful, that they have pre symptomatic type 1 and stage 1 or stage 2. And providers, if they're acutely ill, they have P1B symptoms, you know, think about, you know, maybe checking your blood sugar, urine ketones, something like that. And then also what to do. If you have clinical questions, that's clinic, that's clinical pediatric technology, whoever they work with, that's who you should reach out to. If it's non-urgent and a study question, then they can reach out to our team and we have our, our number right there. And the nice thing about this is, you know, unlike the BPA that makes us all twitch, even though it's all yellow, this you don't have to do anything. You can just go and click wherever it is you would normally click and this goes away, but you know, at least it flashes on the screen and it catches your attention. So in terms of how we've, we've done, we've, we opened up not quite, we're coming up on three years now, which is it's hard to believe. Uh, but we started with one clinic at 69th in Minnesota in Sioux Falls. Uh, let's just say we've learned a lot from that pilot site and we made a lot of changes. And then we expanded some other sites in Sioux Falls and then very quickly we, we expanded further. And we are now open every primary care clinic, not just in Sioux Falls and Fargo, but across the entire Sanford footprint. So 157 clinics. Um, these numbers are from yesterday, so we're actually a little bit higher already today, uh, based on what I had to sign off. We're pushing 7,000 children signed up. And you know, that's just within our own footprint. Um, and you can see this is the blue dots are what we expected for a girl. Uh, with, we're still kind of ahead of that, I think, with some additional marketing, helping people be aware of what this is, so that when they see it on the my chart, they have a better idea. I think there's room for improvement here. But we're already having a clinical impact. If we look at CELAC disease, we've had 56 positive screens. Turns out a dozen of them turn out to have already known they have celiac. It's like, well, okay, so we're picking that up. It means maybe they're not adhering to a strict gluten-free diet. Um, but at least we don't have to do anything about it. It's not a surprise to them. Uh, we have several that are still pending, but we have 30 now that have been referred to GI. And I actually have I've had a number of families reach back out to us, you know, thanking us. It's like, we had no idea that's what was going on. You know, he's always had stomach aches. He's always had this. Uh, uh, he's had problems gaining weight. Uh, as in not enough, unlike many people. Um, so even though this is not my favorite area, we are having an impact and we're having very good feedback from our GI colleagues who are happy to see these people and happy to uh, get them taken care of. On the type one side, uh, we've had a few more positive screens. We have some that are, are still waiting for the confirmatory testing. We have 22 that have positive antibodies. One thing is a little unusual compared to other sites that have tried it in uh, general population screening is we're getting a lot more that are single antibodies instead of the multiple antibodies, but we have had four with multiple antibodies. And as I said, you know, th this is how we define you have type one already. Uh, of these, three of them have already moved on to clinical care, including progressing to stage three diabetes. Now, the key thing here, none of them had symptoms at that time. They are all being treated earlier and in order to, and have, have managed to do this so far, knock on wood, without anybody getting to DK. You know, just humans being humans and denial being, you know, just a, a natural human response. We're going to have somebody that subsequently gets to DK, but we have not yet. 
And so that, that's a lot of what Pledge is. Uh, I wanna just close with a little bit of an overview. I mentioned the different stages of type one diabetes. Over the, the time that I've been here, I've really worked to develop a portfolio of things. We've completed a bunch of things. We have things underway for each stage here so that anybody with type one, we wanna be able to have something to offer that they can participate in. We have a number of exciting things in the pipeline, some things that are started up right now. And you'll notice this actually kind of comes back, you know, in the, the established ones, you know, some of the pump therapies that are coming are, are really exciting where they're starting to listen to CGM, continuous glucose monitors, and nowhere near automatic, but beginning to make some adjustments automatic. Uh, new onset, we have a couple of things that we're trying, rituximab, but that is just something that uh, we're partnering with TrialNet to uh, open. That should be opening up uh, in the next three weeks. Um, I mentioned the younger uh, prevention uh, teplizumab study, and here's our uh, the left receptor replacement drug. We've had some things where we try going back into stage two. Uh, ATG, the rabbit version, TM28 is, is going to be uh, opening up soon uh, for stage two. We had a trial, actually, we were trying hydroxychloroquine that unfortunately didn't seem to make much of it, so that got shut down. But that was in the kids that even had normal glucose. And then at some point, how do we move even beyond that? How do we get to primary prevention? Uh, there's actually a, a study uh, being developed looking at enterovirus B, uh, so Coxsackie viruses in particular, uh, as a vaccine that that's one of the hypothesized triggers. Uh, so that's going to be a very different different scale of study because you're going to have to treat a whole bunch of people in order to try to prevent this ahead of time. Uh, perhaps Janet Risk could help with that. And then the last thing, I just want to close out. You know, so uh, Banting and Best, uh, McLeod, uh, those are the people who discovered insulin. Um, they discovered insulin in 1921. Nobel Prize was 1925. So that's, they used to do things a little faster then, and this was pretty blatant. Uh, but in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech, he included insulin is not a cure for diabetes, it's a treatment enables, we would now say, the person with diabetes to burn sufficient carbohydrates so that protein fats can be added to provide energy for the economic burdens of life. So it keeps them alive, but it's not a cure. We still don't have something we can call as a cure. We're beginning to scratch at that door and get some traction. And I think the next few years are going to be very exciting in terms of what progress we can make 100 years after having nothing but insulin. And so with that, I want to thank you for your attention. A lot of, there are a lot of people who really make this happen. Ann Mays is, is our uh, program manager who, without her, none of this would actually be up and running yet. Magdalena handles a lot of the day-to-day -day background uh, development and working with uh, families. We have a lot of other coordinators. Our, the IT team has absolutely been uh, crucial to the innovative part of this. We have good... Uh, Sub investigators are in our partners. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions and uh, go from there. So, Dr. Griffin, I don't think I've ever actually heard you speak about your research. That was very interesting. Thank you. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> I was wondering, you know, even just from the beginning of your talk, you talked about, you know, the median age of detection is 34, or diagnosis is 34 for type 1. How are these people getting to that age or to those later ages without being severely sick? Uh, yeah, so I kind of mentioned the younger kids is a much more aggressive disease. It progresses faster. And so the kids who are diagnosed, let's say early, even by early elementary school, half of them have antibodies by one year of age. 70% uh, of them have, probably 80% of them have it by age three. Uh, the people who get diagnosed or, you know, were not diagnosed with it, but they develop it as adults, they probably had antibodies smoldering. And uh, at least in the trial net population, which is granted the caveat, those are relatives of people already have it. So perhaps a slightly skewed risk pool genetically. Um, if you don't have antibodies by the time you are finishing teenagers, you're really unlikely to develop 
your first antibody after that. But that's where you can have an antibody that smolders. And it can kind of come and go and come and go. And it takes a long time before you get that epitope spread and before it continues. And then even as you have beta cell destruction, it's just a, a much gentler process. And we don't really understand a lot of the immunology there. We're learning a lot. I didn't talk about NPOD, but that's a network of pancreatic organ donors. Uh, Mark Atkinson in Florida hits that up, up along with a whole team of collaborators. Uh, they're getting transplant quality pancreata and lymph nodes and various other things. And they're, they're finding all sorts of things, especially from the people who have type 1 diabetes, but they're also getting a bunch that are in adults who have like an antibody and they can find the T cells in there clustered around the, ba the islet. You know, it's, it's, it's definitely going on. It's just, it's, it's a gentler thing. And again, why is it around, you know, some of the islets, but other islets look pristine. You know, it's, it's, there's so much of the analogy we don't know. I'm not seeing anything in the chat either. So I I don't think I present that clearly that <laughs> there should be any questions. And I want to echo what Christy said. And you know, we've all heard about pledge, but it was very interesting to hear more details about it. So thank you for presenting. No, and I and I think it comes with some challenges, you know, just the scale of this. They have almost 7,000 kids signed up. You know, it, we, that means we have to do things differently. And I, I, I see Deb Langstrad is on, you know, we're, we're talking even about what's an appropriate way to maintain correct IRB oversight, uh, but have things actually work, not just have it be impossible to do. All right, well, if that's it, maybe I can uh, let everybody get a, we have three minutes before the top of the hour. Uh, thank you for, for your attention, for, for joining. Thank you for your talk, Dr. Griffin.